Hey guys, just a quick message from me before the episode begins. Today I'm joined by Andrew Hansen from The Chaser. Uh, this is probably one of my favourite episodes purely because The Chaser is the biggest influence on my comedy uh, and one of the reasons why I started. Uh, I remember watching them as a kid and it redefined to me what comedy could be and what it is. Um, they everything that they have done from fucking with the media to messing with politicians to their vox pops their stunts even their sketches the variety of comedy and styles that they have put out uh really just showed me that comedy is not just one thing and it doesn't have to be safe and sanitized you can make fun of everything from the Prime Minister to your own employer and the station that you work for, um, the news, everything is up to be made fun of. And The Chaser really demonstrated that to me, specifically with their series Chaser's War and Everything, which is what I grew up on watching and obsessing over and uh, listening to the commentaries to try and understand what they did and how they did it. And um, to have Andrew Hansen on, on my podcast is uh, just an, an absolute honour and uh, it was great for him to come in. The reason why he was on is because he's doing a radio show uh, in Triple M. He records in the studio across the hall from me. So, I mean, technically we're colleagues now, even though we ne- we never work together. Um, but it was uh, just an honour and a very, very cool thing to have him on my uh, podcast. So, uh, please do enjoy this episode. Um, if you don't know... If you're an international viewer and you may not know who The Chaser are, please do look them up. Uh, I recommend starting with their series, Chaser's War and Everything. Um, But they also have CNNN, which is a parody of uh, American corporate news like Fox and all those kinds of things. Uh, They've done over 15 television and radio shows. Uh, Andrew Hansen specifically has two at Australia with Chris Taylor putting on live shows, which I've seen and have been brilliant. They're also a massive influence in terms of how they run their business and also the things that they do. They run a theatre called Giant Dwarf in Sydney, which I've done my show at twice. It's brilliant. Uh, They do radio, they do TV, they help people with their projects, they do live things, they run a satirical magazine. Um, They do so many different things and they have their their fingers in so many different pies that... uh, it's very, very cool to see. Um, so I'm going to stop rambling and get to the point of this interview. Uh, well, the point of this podcast, which is the interview with Andrew Hansen. Please do excuse me during the interview. I may have been a tad nervous. Um, it was just very, very cool to do. So thank you very much to Andrew Hansen for jumping on the podcast. Thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to support what I do, please do consider supporting me on Patreon. You get early access to everything that I do. I think I put this episode up on Wednesday instead of Sunday uh, to all the Patreon supporters. So uh, please do enjoy this interview with uh, one of my major comedic influences, Andrew Hansen. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode 109 of the Speared Sunnies podcast. I'm joined by Andrew Hansen from The Chaser. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, I will guess I'll just give you guys an intro to who Andrew is. Uh, he's from the satire group, The oh, Chaser. Oh, Lord, no. Please don't use Comedy that. Group? No, satire is too hard and sophisticated. <laughs> so isn't satire comedy that isn't funny? I don't, yeah. want, I, don't, I don't want to do that. Yeah, uh, so he's from... I, I think the it's a comedy group. But comedy group. Not a, yeah. The well, Chaser. I hope it is. I like to think so. Well, it's definitely called The Chaser. <laughs> it's a group. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we know it's a group. Yes, a group of people mm. trying to be funny uh, and uh, <laughs> usually nailing it. Um, you, The Chaser was really a massive inspiration for why I started comedy. 13-year-old me is freaking out at the moment. Um, you guys, notable things you guys have done is you started with... Um, uh, a satirical newspaper. Sorry to use that word again. It was meant to be humorous. Yeah, a humorous newspaper. <laughs> uh, the kind of fake news before fake news was a thing. Um, <laughs> then you, other things you've done is CNN and N, which was a, a parody of Fox News and all those American shows, news shows. You guys have done yeah. Chase's War and everything. Uh, Hamster Wheel, and then I don't know over fifteen television shows and radio shows. You guys have done so much stuff. 
Yeah, it's that. weird, isn't it? Um, is it is it over fifteen TV and radio shows? But they're all pretty similar, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> they're they're kind of one show with different titles. I mean, yeah. Somebody told me that too, like once I went over to someone's place for dinner, and he said, yeah. "I lo- I've looked at your new s- series, mm. and I think it's called the the Hamster or something." It was exactly the same as the other series. It had a very <laughs> so different I'm set. Like, okay, well, he didn't notice. Yeah. <laughs> well, it did. We Yes, it certainly had a different set. It had a hamster and the other show mm. didn't. Uh, in our minds, the shows are different. And I think if you care about shows, then they're different. Yeah. Yeah. But the spirit is, is often the same in those chaser group shows. Yeah, well, the has, is there music playing through these headphones? Yeah, man, there is, isn't there? Why don't I turn this... T- Oh, there we go. Yeah. That's better, isn't it? Oh, sorry about That's that. That's much better. That audio. was very distracting. Oh yeah, much better audio. Sorry, we're in a bloody radio studio, and it's they're, they're playing radio of all things. I know, atrocious, awful stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, at the moment, that's why we're here. Is you're you're in Melbourne? You're doing your radio show with the Chaser. Uh, how's that? How's that going? It's yeah. on Triple M. Yeah, we're we're learning the ropes, I guess. It's mm. it's yeah, it's this show called Radio Chaser, and it's um it's Charles Firth and Dom Knight and me, and a revolving door of some of the other guys coming yeah. in, pop in and out. Um, well, it's we're kind of new to it still. You know, it takes ages to do daily radio. I think it. I mean, mm. people tell you it takes years. So we're new to this show, but. We've been on Triple M on and off for, for years and years, and they kind of gave us our first gig yeah. um, a long time ago. Did this little late night show, <clears throat> making sketches. But it's cool. It's good fun, and um, it's nice to make. I especially love doing radio sketches. You know, they're good yeah. fun, like pre-recording some silly sketches. And, and no, uh, sketches are good, and it's, it's something that people don't really do very much in radio which yeah. is strange because it's a lot easier than actually being funny on the fly yeah I know well exactly you get the chance to sit there and at least at least nut out a script yeah you know, and at least think about it instead yeah. of just you record talk, it talking and or whatever edit it then you just hit play and you just sit back play. And, it's lovely. and then you're like I know this will end well <laughs> that's right it's a good way of ending a conversation on the radio mm. too is uh, you know you can't think of anything witty to say to get out yeah. at the end of a conversation so you play a sketch instead um, so yeah no, I would love doing that well I was always a fan of like British radio shows growing up mm. and I loved uh, and they, they had a lot of sketch comedy and they still do on, on UK radio um, and I really loved that stuff yeah there was a show called I'm Sorry I'll Read That Again which was um, made in I think the late 60s or thereabouts and um you know, they had a studio audience. It was like a TV wow. show, you yeah. know, but but just with no cameras, mm. just microphones. And um, they still do that, I think, in the UK, don't they? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they still have live audiences well, on their shows, I'm, like The Unbelievable yeah. Truth. And that sort yeah, of like I've been reading a, a book recently, <clears throat> The Comedians, by some guy called Cliff Nestroff, and it's just the history of how stand-up comedy started. And that's, that's how radio started. It was like 100% scripted. They had an audience, yeah, and, uh, and and it was like fronted by a brand, because instead of playing ads in between, well, there was no songs, so instead of playing ads, right. it was like the the Arnett's oh, show, okay, yeah, and they would yeah. just do a few sketches, and then they'd be like, by the way, Bicky's a good, <laughs> um, and that's how they they started with radio, and, and that's like a really like a real old style of radio is like radio dramas and, and <clears> sketches <throat> and things and I think I don't I, I think that what you guys do on radio is really funny oh cheers thanks man well it's it's but it's different isn't it I guess from what's changed from those days is people used to sit around the radio and listen to it yeah. attentively yeah and now it's it's wallpaper entertainment isn't it you yeah, yeah, yeah like on it's, on it's on in the or background or for, for mm. three minutes driving from A to B. Yeah, while, while you know, yeah, your kids are shrieking at you or, or, your, um, or your partner is, is screaming at you that they want to break up or something. And then, then you've got, you know, Triple M in the background. Mm. Uh, <laughs> occasionally <laughs> pay attention to what's going on there. Which really is a good theme to a domestic. <laughs> It's Triple M. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a great, yeah, great divorce station, Triple M. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, a yeah, mix of rock, sport, and comedy. It's a, <laughs> it's a perfect. Everything you need to get over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Or try to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, how did you, how did you start in comedy? Like, uh, what, what uh, made you want to do it? Did you kind of fall into it, or was it something that you always wanted to do? It kind of felt. No, I did fall into it. I've never really known what I wanted to do with myself. Um, you know, I still don't really know. I'm always wondering, what on earth am I supposed to be doing with, with, with this life you've, mm. you've been given? Um, 
So it was a bit of an accident. I always liked it, though. Um, like, I loved comedy growing up, and even when I was a little kid. Yeah. And a lot of the other kids weren't into it, but even in primary school, you know, I was, <clears throat> I was into Python and mm. the goodies and that sort of stuff. Um, so I kind of had a... And I did it, too. Like, in primary school, I did enjoy... Yeah. Like, reading silly stories to the class and that sort of stuff. But it was never like I had a burning ambition to do comedy or a burning ambition to do anything, really, because I'm not a lazy person. You know, <laughs> I like having fun instead yeah. of working. Um, well, so comedy's I, about as close as you can get. Yeah, it's, it is. That's why That's why I've ended up, I think, as, as the compromise yeah. position. <laughs> it's like you can, you've can. got to work hard at it, but there is it's fun as well. Mm. Um, so I tried to be a musician, you know, first. And, yeah. Um, but the, I, I found... Yeah, people are in those pub gigs. Like they really only listened when I was playing a silly song, or um, yeah, or just piss farting around between the songs. And <laughs> I heard like there, there there are a few comedians who started that way. Mm. I, I think um, even like really big. Well, the the most famous one I can think of is Billy Connolly, I suppose. Who, I didn't know that he started in music. Yeah, yeah, he had. Well, so he said in some interview. Um, right. Yeah, and he said that he said the same thing that you know people. He was telling jokes between the songs, and the jokes mm. gradually became longer, and the songs sh- shorter <laughs> and less because yeah. the audience seemed more interested in the yeah, of in the gag stuff. Um, well, music, so, music and comedy is is uh, weirdly related. Yeah, it is because it's all rhythm and timing. Yeah, and, yeah it is. Because I know I know heaps of people in the Australian rap scene, and oh right. And half of them have like just written jokes, but they've never done them. But writing jokes is something that really? they kind of enjoy as a hobby. Whereas a Do lot they? of comedians I know just play guitar or something. Yeah, yeah. Like I've got mm. a friend, uh, Greeley, who's like quite a big Australian rapper, and he's recently started doing stand up. Yeah, right, really, yeah. Well, they are related, especially rap, because that's verbal mm. communication, isn't it? It's, mm. you know, it's, it's making a point and. And punchlines has always been a part of rap as well. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. They build up to Mm. deliver a punchline. Yeah, yeah. No, they are related. And and, and it's often... You can cheat with a comedy song too. Like, the material doesn't have to be very funny, but if it rhymes... And the song doesn't have to be very good either. (laughs) No, no, it doesn't. The music comes in the middle with it. Which I think... I think maybe that's why you... Because I think that you're brilliant at piano and and singing and guitar and all that kind of stuff. Whereas probably because you started out trying to do music so you got really good at music yeah whereas I started with comedy so I got average at guitar and I was like that's that's all I need I know three chords that's it can't really sing doesn't matter I can put some jokes in there it is all you need yeah you just got to belt it out mm. um, with, with, with a comedy song I mean, I mean they can be a bit hackneyed like you know because people always demand what you uh, I often get pestered to do more comedy songs like mm. oh you should do uh, one every day or one every week or whatever but um, there aren't that many good comedy songs in me, you know, and I'd rather that they be solid. So that's why yeah. I, I, I don't do many, or I, have, I haven't done many of them, really. Um, well, I think, I think comedy songs are easy to do, but hard to do a really good one. That, yeah, it is hard to do a really good one. No, that's true. And a lot of the, I mean, some of the old classic ones actually don't really have jokes in them at all. Like some of the Python songs. Um, Just good songs. They're good songs, they're whimsical. Yeah. They don't really have any comedy in them, some of them. Like the Universe song has one joke at the end. Mm. And it's not even a marvellous joke. Um, you know, and, and even Always Look on the Bright Side of Life, that's more about the context. I mean, it's so beautiful when it happens at that point well, in the yeah, movie. Well, because that song, if you listen to it without the movie, it's not funny at all. It's just well, kind no, of it's, a nice it's song. Well, no, it's a nice song. It makes you feel mm. sort of... Good in a whimsical, or in a sort of bittersweet way. Yeah. And, you know, it's got, yeah, it's happy with a twist of yeah. lemon, which is what you want in a good song. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the but context, no, they don't, the you know, context that they sing it in is ridiculous. That's well, that, why. Yeah, it's yeah. Funny. No, that's right. The context is funny, and um, like I've been watching, <clears throat> I'm, I'm late to it, but I'm watching Toast of London. Um, I don't know if you've seen this that that show, British comedy series. No. It's a wonderful show. I love it. Um, although Chaz Lichardella was telling me he doesn't like it much. Um, but Chris Taylor loves it. Mm. Chris and I have a very similar sense of humour. Anyway, there are songs in that show. Every episode features a song, which... And there's never a joke in the songs. Yeah. Um, 
But they kind of work. I suppose they provide a change of pace. Um, but it was never something... I, I don't know, at least when I've worked with the other Chaser guys, we would always determine that the songs need to have jokes in them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or try. Um, well, I think so, because I think it's... it's because I don't really do comedy songs anymore because I used to do it in my act. Uh, like, I've done yeah. two shows and I had two... In both the shows, I had a comedy song. And eventually, I got to the point where I was I was like, I think I'm funnier without it. Right, and, um, yeah. and musically, I wasn't very good. So they almost started to feel like filler when put next to my, my pure stand-up stuff. Did they? Yeah, right. Which, which is interesting because you probably... Did you work harder on the songs than on the stand-up? Or? Well, no, that's why they felt like filler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why. It's yeah. a lazy song. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, no, they... Um, and, that, and they can be naff, can't they? Comedy songs can be, like... I think, I think one of the characters in Veep says something like, um, only assholes play comedy songs. <laughs> something like that. That's funny. Um, it, it, we've, we've almost moved beyond doing them now and and um yeah but yeah you know but i grew up loving things i, I grew up loving kevin bloody wilson when i yeah. was a, when i was a kid yeah i loved his stuff when i was growing up people always i'm, I'm glad you did, you're not appalled and astonished because often i say that to um like comedy people and they frown upon me well that makes sense he's he Why did a lot think? of comedy songs and and he was quite yeah, edgy he's, he's for really his time. He's really talented and uh, well, he's still doing good stuff. Yeah, he's still I, doing. I mean, it. yeah, yeah. He, he was very edgy for his time. I think. Mm. Um, I mean, it was almost the, I'd never heard such rudeness when I was yeah. listening to his stuff when I was a kid. Then again, I was a kid. I probably wasn't allowed to be mm. listening to his stuff. Um, and he's a great musician, great singer. But um, but a lot of people. In the comedy scene seemed to look down on on him. I don't know why. I, I, I was I always thought he was great. I think um, I think the comedy scene in Australia has a real issue with people who do things differently, mm. in terms of not just the material they do, but the way they run their business or the way they succeed. If it's, right, if yeah. it's outside if it's, the uniform well, way, you would know about this. Cause that, yeah. Well, I think you're, I've, a bit, you're a bit unconventional in the way you run your stuff. Well, right? yeah, like the the internet. The internet age of stand-up is uh, very new in Australia, and also quite mm, unique. Mm. Like I think just about most of the people that are big online that are just one person in Australia all do stand-up, which is very weird. Like that doesn't really exist in America. Like, oh, right. Like people yeah. in, in, that are big online in America will do live shows, but they're more like meet and greets, and will sing a few songs and ask me questions and stuff. But in in Australia, it's the people who are big online are probably more serious about stand-up comedy. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Well, well we've got a strong culture of it in Australia, mm. everywhere, I guess. Like, um, I don't know. Tom Gleeson said to me he thinks Australia's one of the only places where it's normal, or where people think it's normal to pay money to see somebody do some comedy. Mm. Like, he, he reckons that... Actually, not many countries where that's just a, an accepted, wide, mainstream sort of thing to do. Yeah. Um, well, the Comedy Festival has done a really good job at at ingraining itself in Australian culture. Like, yeah. It's well, been it around has. for like 20 years. Right. And yes. Like, when I grew up, just watching the gala was a thing that you did. Yeah, so, like, yeah. The gala's on, we'll watch it, pick our favourite acts and go see a few shows. Right, right. It's just so what you did, eh? living in Melbourne? Yeah, well, I was in Melbourne. I don't know if, yeah, it, was, if yeah. it was different because you're not so much Sydney? in Sydney. Yeah, I'm from Sydney originally. I mean, I'm in Melbourne now. Mm. But um, yeah, no, I mean, in Sydney, you would you would watch the gala on TV mm. if you were into that sort of thing. But of course, you couldn't then easily of go course, and see the yeah. shows. <laughs> twenty no, years yeah. ago, like a yeah. flight to Melbourne was like a year's salary. I mm. mean, twenty years ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a bit, but for Melbourne, yeah. Oh, but the festivals become so huge now. I mean, it's this voracious monster of a thing with oh it's massive so many acts um, yeah but it, I'm a bit concerned that it kind of it's just so tough for um, for anyone who isn't one of the top acts to, mm. to, to make a profit at the Melbourne Festival I mean there's so so many acts now it's well, become a bit unwieldy I, I wonder the maybe. first year I did it 
Uh, there was it was the biggest one they'd ever had. I don't think I don't think it's been bigger in subsequent years. It was over five hundred acts, and yeah. I remember I went to <clears throat> like an information session of if it's your first time come to this, and the the official festival representative said to the people if you're if you're coming here to make a profit, you should reconsider. Yes, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah. and that was like the official. <laughs> mm, this mm. is what, and I I kind of thought well, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, I, look, I think the festival organisers might, might might make a profit, but the uh, and I don't I don't think they really care whether the mm. acts make a profit. Um, well, that's <laughs> I think <laughs> that's my is, impression of it. <laughs> it is it is a, an issue. I think the festival um, does have just because it's it's so big, um, and that's that's because I'm deciding to tour in September this year. Yeah. Just because I wanted to see how much benefit. I got out of the festival, mm. um, and I might be wrong. It might be a catastrophic failure. That might be the only reason why people are coming. Well, it can be. It depends on the year too. I mm. think I think you do better in some years than other years. Um, I mean, I toured shows with Chris Taylor two years running. We did mm. one show and then a different show the next year, 2014, 2015. Yeah, and that, and it was quite different. I mean, the the two years was just almost totally random. The mm. experience of how many tickets you might sell in one city um, there didn't mm. seem to be any pattern to it. Um, as far as I can tell, so yeah, it's a funny business, isn't it? It's a, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's the wild west. You don't know what you're doing. Well, that's that's kind of that's why I've, that's why I like the the, the internet and because right. it's I think it's about as much control as you can have in terms of your audience because you know because all of my people are online. I can see how many people who like me are in Melbourne and what age they are. Oh, oh right, of course. and how many of those yeah. people are within. Forty kilometers of the venue that I God, want to do. You're, you're Facebook. You're you're like a, a Facebook. You you know too much. No, right? Facebook you know knows too, too much, much about everything. <laughs> I'm shocked how <laughs> no, much no. information they, it t- they tell me. With, yeah, it's yeah. like I'll give them five dollars and they'll be like, "All right, so this person likes you, and they like Vodafone, and they generally spend <laughs> right. money on their apps on and all this kind of shit." And I'm like, if this is what you're telling me, the shit that you're not telling me must be even deeper and scarier. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes, you know, use it, Lord. You use it to your to your advantage. Well, yeah. it's great. You can, um, you know, if you can sell to these Vodafone loving people, <laughs> it's one wonderful. Well, yeah, I think I think that's why there is a bit of pushback against the whole internet thing because it's so different to the way that everybody else has, has um, supposed to come up in terms of you know you you do the festival and then you get picked and then. Oh, that's right. The the method. No, that's true. And I think we found that a bit in the chase ago because we came. We we were doing comedy on on radio and TV before mm. we'd really done much live stuff. Mm. I mean, I well, a couple of us had done a, a fair bit of student theatre. I I'd done a, a lot of student theatre, but I hadn't really done. Well, none of us had done stand up, and I remember in the early days, one of the other guys. I think we were doing scene in an end or something. They said to me, "Oh, look, you know, a lot of the the comics at Melbourne, <laughs> they're not they're, they don't feel very warmly towards you because you haven't done the stand up thing, you know. Not 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 all of them, but apparently some people sort of thought there's a way you should be doing this, and you shouldn't be doing a comedy show on TV unless you've already done stand up. I at, think at that's venues, a, you know, you're not allowed to yeah. do it that way. Yeah, um, through via via a, a comedy newspaper and then." <laughs> Other things, yeah. So, so you might be, yeah. Maybe, maybe there is something to that that, that we want to see people do, approach it the the right way. Well, I think <laughs> I think that because, especially in Melbourne, because of how much good the festival has done for the stand up <clears throat> culture, they do. They've kind of earned the control around the the industry in terms of if they want to make you someone, they can. But with the internet, I think that's kind of flipping. It because you know before they could, they could tell you someone's famous internationally, and they are because you said it. But yeah, now you can now be like, you, oh really? And you look it up, and like, it's like, who's that? Two hundred followers. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and I think I do think it's interesting that you yeah. guys kind of copped a similar thing because I think it is it is something in Melbourne where because there definitely is a method to get yeah. to the top. If you go outside that, it's almost like people think, oh, you're skipping the queue. Yeah. And then you're standing there going, there's no queue, man. You yeah. Can... <laughs> yeah it's a, it, it should be about the quality of the material, really, mm. not, not, not the flying hours. Or, 
<laughs> that sort of stuff. Although flying hours helps to, mm. to to get the quality, I suppose. But then there are some people who just have a knack, aren't there? There are some, you know... Um, some people are just amazingly good when they're really young. Mm. Isn't that weird? Like Sean yeah, Hughes, you know, we lost Sean Hughes, um, who passed away recently. And I mean, he was... He won that big prize at Edinburgh when he was like 24, I think. Yeah. You get the occasional, mm. you know, Bo genius young... One. Ge- yeah, that's right. But, yeah. but yes. Um, but most people seem to hit it a bit later than that, um, I think. Most well, of I us think, have to wait yeah. till late 20s, early 30s or something. To... Well, I, th- I think with stand-up, the... You're allowed to be more insightful as you're older because, one, you have more life experience, so you kind of are more insightful, but also people look at you, they'll look at a 40-year-old guy and they'll be like, oh, he's seen, he's seen some shit. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, being Whereas, weathered is good for a stand-up, isn't yeah. it? I love, I love seeing a weathered stand-up. Some I of those so. old, old American lived-in stand-ups. Yeah. <laughs> who can barely stand up. Yeah. Like, yeah, I love... You You, you, you think, oh, here we go, he's got some stories to tell. This, yeah. This guy's yeah, exactly. Like, you know, you find... The young, when, like when I was younger, I mean, I am still young, but when I was like 19 and starting stand up, I had all of these ideas that I wanted to talk about, but uh, audience wouldn't listen to me and I wasn't, I didn't have the skills to talk about mm. these topics. So you kind of revisit them when you're a little bit older mm. and you have mm. more life experience and people take you seriously. It's like, oh, he can almost grow a beard. I might pay attention to this. <laughs> yeah. No, there is something to that, yeah, whether people will actually pay attention to you because you look too young. Um, but then young people also have, you know, cutting-edge idea. I mean, mm. they may not have the life experience, but I think what a lot of young people do have is a, a new new takes on things that you don't expect or, or, mm. or just interesting way-out-there ideas. Um you know, which maybe get harder and harder to come up with as you get old and rickety. Yeah. Well, that yeah, that just comes from being closer mm. to the new generation as well, is you just connect with them better, and which is, I think, something that, that you guys did really well, is when when you guys were doing, like, CNN and, and, and Chase's War and everything as well, you, like, my school, that was, you were all we talked about. Yeah, I, I was always... I was always really pleased when I discovered that schools were into that show because, because mm. <laughs> I, you know, we were, it was odd because we were older, we were like thirty odd or something by the time we were doing the chases were on everything, um, give or take a few years I can't remember, but yeah, to find I, I loved it that school kids were into that. Um, it made me think, oh, I must be doing something good because mm. um, young people are fussy, you know, and they don't. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they wouldn't like it. If, um, whereas nowadays, the uh, mostly the only people who, who talk to us are in their nineties or or cen- centenarians, you know, yeah. uh, who uh, kind of <laughs> people who they're the only people who still watch the ABC. I think. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well, it is it is going that way. Television, but I don't know. I think the ABC is always going to figure it out because they don't have to deal with advertising, so they can kind of put their shit online and it doesn't hurt them. No, that's true. They might they might be all right, actually. Yeah, they don't have to. That's right. They don't have to do with the ad thing. Um, mm. Although, gee, they face some challenges, don't they? Well, there hasn't been a Chaser show on ABC for two years now, so I don't know. I, I'm not sure what whether I don't know what our next TV thing will be. I don't know, and it might not be a full Chaser team thing. It might be sort of a sub a subset of us because we're always well, chipping guys, away at things. How many people are in the Chaser? It's like six people. <laughs> I, who knows, Lewis? It's bloody... It's a weird umbrella organisation. I don't even know yeah. if I'm in it. I, I, I really don't. I mean, like... Because there was things... Years and years ago, some people put in, like, 50 bucks each or something into a company. Yeah. And I didn't. I was too broke. <laughs> and, and now some of those people are sort of on the board of, of Chaser Publishing, I think it's called. Right. And I'm not. Uh, <laughs> But, oh, but so some of these people, people that are not on screen are on. Oh, like people who have just who have nothing to do with comedy at all. Like, like, <laughs> like people who people just have just normal had 50 jobs bucks at the time. Yes, they had fifty bucks in in nineteen ninety eight or whenever it That's was. Um, so they get to make board level decisions <laughs> about the chaser. I, I, look, I don't know who's in the chaser. Like Chaz keeps telling me that. Oh well, we're working with this person, this person, this person. Because some of those guys are making. You know, the checkout, which is that mm-hmm. TV show, you know, about shopping or whatever. I wasn't really interested in that, so 
I'm not doing it. And and um, and so they, you know, they're working with all sorts of young writer performers. Uh, and I'm not sure if they're in the chaser or not in the. Ch- I don't know. Um, it's, it's it's baffling to me. I'm just doing my own thing now. And, and mm. uh, if it happens to have the chaser name on it, <laughs> maybe it does. Um, well then, you know. Well, we I'll put do, the chaser name uh, on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you have, you can, but you then have to pay a percentage. Oh, I'm not putting on the podcast. <laughs> I'll yeah, pay yeah. a percentage of my one dollar that I made yeah, yeah. from this. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we, you know, we all have to pay some sort of percentage if we use the name, mm. and it has to it has to involve a minimum number of of the of the original team. Yeah, that's an interesting um, way of, of doing it. Yeah, it's, it's well, confusing. It makes, it makes sense. It's very confusing. I mean, I now understand bands who who sort of have had all these confusing stories of who's in the Beach Boys and who's in yeah. the bloody who's in Pink Floyd at any given time. Mm. Um, and why you know I mean bands well they end up suing each other uh, those people. Um, well, yeah, it's I, I think it's kind of remarkable that. how long you guys have stayed together. It's weird, isn't it? I for know. a group of any mu- musicians or comedians of any kind, a group to stay together for that long, creative people almost always end up butting heads or, or yeah, ripping apart. They do, and we do butt heads. Like you know, we all have a different senses mm. of humour from each other, um, which is why our, sh- our shows are so sort of mm. all over the shop. There are there are often five or six different kinds of yeah comedy squashed into one <laughs> one show. Which in a way is a disadvantage, I think, because um, it's our shows don't please somebody who has a certain taste. Mm. Uh, that they'll like some of the show and not the rest of it, and then somebody else will like yeah. other bits of the show and not the rest of it. And same with us who make the show. Like often, you know, Jules will be very unhappy during one of my bits of the show, and vice versa, um, <laughs> <laughs> because. We have different senses of humour, yeah. but we understand that it's a it's a group and it's a package, and that mm. it, you know that's that's how we work. And so we learned to sort of yeah um, just tolerate those differences. Well, I think that's why uh, that uh, that's why I was and still am such a fan of what you guys do because you're just not really in any kind of genre beyond yeah. comedy like the like a lot of people yeah I suppose I am incorrect calling the satire show The Chase of War and Everything especially I keep going back to that I know it's mm. old but it's that show a lot of people just remember for the vox pops and the, and the stunts and stuff but it was like a kind of a tonight show mixed <laughs> with a variety show and for some reason there's music in it and also sketches <laughs> yeah and also a current affair shit like it was just full of everything it was a salad. Yeah. It was like... Uh, which was good. I loved that format. And I, I always... I, I, I want to do more of it, actually. Mm. Um, most of the other guys don't. But it, we do in, live in, a, in an age now where you can... Where shows come back now, don't they? Yeah. Um, after ages and ages away, like Gilmore mm. Girls, has a, suddenly there's a new season. Isn't that nuts? A, X-Files. Suddenly there's a new season. Isn't that? Yeah. yeah. But it's good. I mean, if the, if the original writers and cast are still there and, and the audience... Wants more, then um, I don't see why you shouldn't make more mm. of it, really. So I'd be happy to do more chases, more, and everything. It'd be prank light. We probably wouldn't do so many, so many pranks because we're sort of old and pathetic, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It'd be, but it could still be a, mm. uh, this kind of salad mix of all these different sorts of sketches and songs and that sort of stuff. Um, I'd like to do that. Whether it will happen, I don't know. Yeah. Um, do you have? Um... Do you have like a, a favorite sketch or stunt that you did that that you feel no one talks about? Oh, there's the right, apex yeah, thing, obviously. Yeah, everyone but... always asks me about that. Yeah, yeah. Or but... they, they call it that thing. As yeah, well. I often find I get in a taxi and he'll say something like, "You guys did that thing." Yeah, <laughs> and I know what he means. Yeah, okay, you mean the apex <laughs> motorcade stunt? Yeah, where we well, tried I'll to... just explain. Do you, want to explain you better that explain it quickly. So you that... had better. Yes. So the APEC is this. like a big political summit in a, that happened in Australia once, and <laughs> probably never again because of you. <laughs> uh, a whole bunch of the world's politicians met in Australia, and it was a giant uh, security thing, of course, in uh, Australia. And uh, you guys decided to show up in a motorcade pretending to be from Canada, which was not invited to, to APEC, and uh, tried to get into the event, and... Uh, to your surprise, 
from listening to the commentary, the police let you in. Mm, yeah, um, we weren't expecting that motorcade to be let to be let in. Mm. No. And then uh, eventually, you almost got into the event, which would have been a massive security thing and almost dangerous for you if you did get in as in, as intruders. Um, so ended up turning the motorcade around and then getting let out again, which all, again is ridiculous. Why would they let the motorcade come in and then turn around? That's that's incredibly suspicious behaviour. And then uh, Chaz, I believe, popped out of the limousine that was supposed to be from Canada dressed as uh, Osama Bin Laden yeah, that's right. And didn't yes. get shot in the head, he which, didn't again, get, no. probably shouldn't have happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. No, it would have been great if he'd been shot in the head. It would have, been, <laughs> would have provided the perfect punchline to that piece, and we kind of needed it, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the original premise of it was that there are all yeah, these that world leaders... that was supposed to happen because you never thought you would get in. Well, we did, no, we didn't think we'd get past the gate. It was just a simple... It was the same... A lot of our stupid pranks were just um, about turning up at the door and asking mm. to be let in somewhere yeah. at some company because we had some mm. some stupid prop to offer them especially a company who'd stuffed up yeah. um, we'd go and make fun of them and so we spent a lot of time shooting ourselves talking to security guards at doors <laughs> And um, but yeah that motorcade for some reason got waved through um, the premise was that we felt it was unfair that one world leader had been had not been invited to the yeah. epic summit, which was Osama bin Laden. Mm. Um, so we, could, we could sneak him in if we put him put him yeah. in a Canadian car. Yeah. Um, that was the the comic premise of it. But yeah, no, it, it it sort of. I mean, it got a lot of media attention, and then a lot of people started watching the show uh, who hadn't been watching it before that episode, mm. which I think was bad for the show, and ultimately it was the death. Ironically, it was the death knell of, of the show. I think because. Um, Suddenly, all these people were watching our show, who our show was not for. Mm. Like, it was a pretty weird show. It was a niche sort of show. It was sometimes in poor taste. It was experimental. It was hit and miss. So it was never meant to have a huge mainstream audience. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that was the turning point, maybe that episode after which we had this mainstream audience and they were confused well, and that offended episode had and appalled. Three million viewers, I read. Yeah, which is nationwide. Huge for television. It was big yeah, it was big back then, two thousand and seven in Australia. Mm. Um Yeah, yeah. But it 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 changed it did it change the way we had to think about the show because all of a sudden all these Do you think that put more pressure on you, having yeah. just more people watching? Oh it, it, well it did because they weren't our people, you know, yeah, and um, a few years down the track, our our, our audience has, has now dwindled back to the niche level that it originally was. Uh, you know, people who actually like our mm. stuff and, and who it resonates with. But then we were in this very weird position where, and the media thought we were clickbait for a long time, so they'd always be running these. Yeah, the media do this for any popular TV show. They they run uh, reports about how outrageous and offensive the show is. You know, they they do it now for Married at First Sight. Well, I think the media, a lot of people think that Australia has this big PC culture and the media will get angry at you if you offend people. But I think it's the actually the opposite is true. The media love it when they can write something about you of, of supposedly offending someone because it's not actually offended people that read the articles. It's people that are not offended. They'll read it so they can be like, the bloody news is ridiculous, and <laughs> and get outraged not by you, but by the article about you causing outrage. Oh yes, there is. I know what you mean. Yeah, there is a there is a certain type of person who who is outraged by. I do that shit. An article that's trying to create outrage. I I, yeah, I, yeah. I fall for that shit all the time. Yeah. <laughs> when someone's like, oh, this comedian said this horrible thing, and I'll, and I'll click on it being like, I bet this article's wrong. And yeah, then I'll be like, yeah. this is what they want. Yeah, yeah, they do. Well, it's both, isn't it? Isn't it? Mm. I, think it's, I think it's that, but I think there's also people who genuinely get outraged. Oh, they definitely the way, are. The way the media wants them to. Yes. I think, I think, I think there are two kinds of people. You know, that, <laughs> well, being outraged and offended is enormously enjoyable, I think. Um, yeah. I, I love being offended, um, and I think everybody does. Mm. So, um, you yeah, know, that's why it's become an international pastime. I think the internet has, has really helped this in the last few years. Mm. Now we have this culture of outrage, 
with us and outrage every hour. Well, it's, it's fun. It it's matter. fun to be outraged. Yeah, and it mm. doesn't matter what you say because being outraged is just to you being correct. And people love being right and telling yeah, people yeah, yeah. why they're right and why the other people are wrong. I like it. I like doing that. I love being yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> it is good. Everyone, everybody likes it. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting how you talk about when, when you got a bigger audience and people were watching your show who weren't your people. Mm. That, that happens still. Like, and, and even online, like whenever, very rarely I'll have something that goes viral. Um, and whenever I've I've kind of clocked it, whenever I get a video that has more than a million views, it has now gone so far outside my regular core audience of maybe thirty to a hundred thousand people who mm. will who like my stuff and know what I do. And then it's so far out of that, it reaches people that no matter what you're doing would just not like your stuff. Yeah, and that's, that's when right. you get people and that's yelling you get... at you. Yes, like, <laughs> I suppose the most. The biggest example of that is... <laughs> did you ever see my, my video where I went to an anti-vaccine? Yeah, 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 yeah. Which, which was huge, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that went, that went nuts. Oh, and, and that's, a, that's a touchy subject, mm. too. So you're really playing with fire there, or with, or with syringes. Yeah, yeah, well, that was my first ever Vox Pop that I'd, that I'd ever done. And, uh... Because uh, it's, it's interesting... Oh, was that the first time you'd done a Vox Pop as well? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. that's the first time I'd wow. ever done it. And, uh... I think I took, a, I took, um, I was trying to research online of how the fuck do you do a Vox Pop properly because mm. obviously they're heavily edited and, and it's just, and it's always essentially you coming back with a funny line to whatever the person said. And I just went back to commentaries of Chase's War and everything. And, and I caught, I think maybe it was Chaz talking about conversation maps. Oh, that's nice that you went to that. Yeah, right. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, well, Chaz is, has a very scientific approach to Vox Pops. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I think when I met him, he also briefly explained conversation maps, which is basically, and it's for sales as well. Basically, if they say yes, you say that. If they say no, mm. you say this. Yeah. And no matter what they say, as long as you plan your question to have one or two, maybe three different answers, you have something to come back with that. that that's right, a flow chart. That's, that's what someone like Chaz or me has to do who aren't very witty. Whereas Craig <laughs> Rucastle is incredibly good off the cuff. Yeah, he doesn't need a funny. map. He, yeah. he, no, he's just got... He seems to have been born with all these <laughs> automatic maps in his yeah. head, so he, he he doesn't do them that way. He just goes out and is funny on the spot. Mm. But, um, yeah, others of us who, who, who don't have that skill, <laughs> we think about it in advance and go out yeah. with a script. I, I used to go out with a full script in my head, really. I'd write it like a sketch. If, uh, if ever I did a, mm. any sort of interactive piece on the street, I'd, I'd actually write a script. And you'd put a little blank in there for something that they'd do. Yeah. But it didn't really matter what, what they would do in a way. Cause, yeah. Because I'd always have the comedy in the rest of the thing. Um, even in the Vox Pop, sometimes you could do that. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, no, that's, that's, yeah, that's kind of how you need to go into it. Because you can't just, I don't know, you can't just show up with a microphone and be like, this will be funny. You have to have a... Well, no. Some people do, though. Some people do. Charles Firth does, does that. Actually, daily radio. Now that we're doing daily radio, we don't have time. Mm. So Charles often goes out and does a quick vox pop in that style. Yeah. <laughs> of just with not, not much plan. But I think that's okay. You get away with it if it's just a thing on the radio every day. Mm. The, the stakes are low. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I suppose it depends on the, on the event. I've done, I've done a couple that have had no... No planning. Like I went, I went to a comic convention, and that's easy because I'm a nerd. I'm like, oh, I'll just bully the nerds. Oh, right, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, that, yeah, and you can do that, can't you? If you if you know, yeah, the, like the you mindset, know the culture, you can destroy it. Yeah. yeah. Like I had, uh, I had, I had one guy because there's lots of people dressed up in costume as cosplay. So I had uh, came across one guy that was dressed up as Inspector Gadget. <laughs> So I did this rapid fire question thing. So I'm like, you've got you. Do, I'm going to ask you a question. You answer as quickly as you can. So I was like, um, I was like, uh, what's uh, who's a famous Pokemon character? And he'd be like Pikachu. And then I'd be like, oh, who's Batman's sidekick? And he's like, it's Robin. And I'm like, how do you make a girl come? And and then he just freezes, not because he doesn't know how, but because the question is so shocking. It's like, what the fuck? And then you just have a few seconds of silence, and then 
<laughs> well, it's entirely possible that somebody dressed as Inspector Gadget doesn't know. That's true. I, you, know, I, I, you know, but but we we've got to give him the benefit of the doubt. Don't yeah, you? he might be very good with gadgets. I mean, uh, well, know. yeah, true. Go go yeah. gadget vibrator, <laughs> <laughs> and then you're sweet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, that, that's that's right. You've got a built-in gag there. You don't don't you? If you go out with that with that script, mm. then. And that's the sort of thing I liked doing because you'd have the security. Yeah. Yeah. Do, yeah. So uh, what we were going back to is, was there anything? So the APEC thing was huge because of the because of the news picked it up and everything. But what was something that you think didn't get credit or, or was underrated or, or your favourite thing that you? Guys oh have done? yeah, lots of them. Uh, uh, yeah, I, my favourite bits were always bits that nobody noticed, but that's because my taste is, is kind of oh, is out of step with most people's, I think. Like, oh, most of the things I seem to like, mm. not many people like, and I've always been that way. Um, which, which, it's weird living in a world where you don't like the same things as everybody else. But <laughs> I like, there are some popular things I like. I like mm. the Beatles and I like Game of Thrones. But, um, no, I loved, well, the thing I always say was my favourite, probably my f- favourite, the one that just makes me laugh every time I saw it was um, a piece that Chaz fronted which was and it might have been his concept too um we used to get invited to the logies every year mm. and um we went and shot a, a what what Chaz called the logies bonehead challenge oh that's so, you know, the bonehead i love challenge. that yeah you, know, you like that well, you know it i'm it was glad so, you know that I'm yeah glad you know that it was, I love it was that. just so stupid it's and so simple stupid. it's very but simple. it was it, i thought that was great Oh, good. I'm glad you liked it. It always makes me laugh when I watch it because Chaz's performance, I think, is very funny in that and very precise. And he certainly, I mean, he put all of his. You know, mm. Chaz is a bit, um, bit Asperger's or something. He's, you know, he's, he's. If you haven't watched it, basically, the challenge was at the Logies is like our what the fuck? Uh, it's our Emmys. America? It's Emmys. our TV awards in TV Australia. Awards. It's the Australian TV awards. Yeah. So there's cameras everywhere. It's very and lame. It's ripe for taking. Yeah, it's piss like out the Emmys it. with no credibility at all. Exactly. Yeah. So Chaz, well, you guys set Chaz a challenge of how many shots can he get in the background of acting like an idiot, like they like they do on any kind of TV show where there's people in the background just waving and being an idiot. <laughs> yeah. And so. <laughs> This whole piece is just Chaz running around an award ceremony, waving in the background of camera shots. <laughs> of all these shots. Because it's live, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it, was, it goes live to air on Channel yeah. 9. So he was able to do it. And, um, yeah, it was, it, it was a nice way of just bursting the bubble of the, the whole Logie thing, too, because mm. it, it was it, it, the message of that piece is that the Logies is just a farce. And uh, especially with Chaz, every time somebody won a Logie, the, the, the camera would be on the winner and yeah. Chaz would be there behind them, <laughs> fist pumping in victory, Ooh, as, so as, if, as if this was just the greatest moment were of his life. Were you there in person? Yeah, well, we all yeah. were. So how hard was that to do? Really Cause... hard. It was It was hard because, you know, you didn't quite know who would win each Logie. Because there'd be cameras everywhere and you don't know were, who's won and what camera yeah. is on. It was an odds game, really, because um, you could sort of tell, though, like, there would be... If somebody was about to win, mm. there was often a camera operator looming over them with a camera in their face, ready to get the reaction of the... Oh, of of the, of the but only at the last second. Yeah. So Chaz would have to look around this ballroom and, and he... If you yeah. saw the camera operator going for um, whoever, I don't know the names of any actors, yeah. <laughs> Asha Keddy or whoever it was, yeah. um, Lisa McCune back then maybe, mm. she used to win everything, <clears throat> then he'd run over, you know, he'd piss bolt across the room and be yeah. ready to celebrate in the background of the shot. Um, and then it had a nice punchline too, that piece. It was nicely structured because mm. then at the, at the end of the night for the big award, um, you know, Chaz went on stage with... <laughs> With the full cast <laughs> of some show that had won, that he's not on, got nothing to do with. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't on the show, but he just joined them on stage. That's so funny. Up, it, it makes me laugh just thinking about it. Yeah. So for me, that's the piece. I don't know. That's that's, that's the probably one of my favorites too. Actually, is the funniest one. It's the one that makes me laugh the most. Yeah. Um, um, did. Were other people who were not in the chase of wise to it on the night? Did yeah, they yeah, understand what you were doing? They were. A few people were wise to it, and, and some people were helping Chaz out, actually, if they were a really good sport. Um, I can't, <laughs> can't remember who, but there were a few TV industry people who cottoned into it and would actually yeah. come over to Chaz and tip him off the, the cameras over there. That's or funny. So a few people would help. Yeah. Um, 
the security were annoyed about it. And certainly the next year when we <clears throat> did a different thing at the Logies, um, where a few of us walked along the red carpet with cocaine I spilling out of our as well. pants. Or something, yeah. Accidentally leaving this trail of cocaine at the <laughs> red carpet. Um, the, the security were brutal on on that year because yeah. they'd been sort of told about us. About you, you yeah. Know, so so they were um, they got violence with us actually. Really? Yeah, it was weird. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, one one of, yeah one of them. I'm a scrawny guy, so mm. you know, I can't I can't deal with the security guard. But yeah, one of them really <laughs> because I'd spilt some cocaine on the red carpet. Oh yeah. man, he grabbed me and, and twisted my arm behind my back really hard. Wow. And um, I just saw arm for days. That's nuts. That. Yeah. Another one I th- was was it also the Logies where you rocked up in uh, a reporter's makeup truck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were, oh, there was one. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, Naomi Robson used to. Well, she 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 wore a lot of makeup. Mm. I think when she was a host of this awful current affairs show today tonight, and um, no longer yeah, yeah, we turned up. A, yeah, Naomi Robson's makeup truck turned up. I can't remember the. I actually can't remember why or. Where I it think went it was, after that. I think it was a very... I think it might even have been part of the cocaine thing where it was a, almost a throwaway. Oh, it might have been just a cutaway. Where, of, oh, we arrived in this. Oh, anyway, okay. here's yeah, the main that joke. That was it. Thank, I'm glad you know my stuff better <laughs> than I do. I, I used to... I, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm borderline autistic good. with that show. No, that's, I'm glad you do. That happened to me when I interviewed um, a couple of the goodies. Because I, I knew their show a lot better than they did. Mm. <laughs> Which is embarrassing. <laughs> it was a bit embarrassing. Because you I think, think, they, you think they would know everything well, about it. Yeah, kind then... of. But they, I think they quite liked that, <laughs> that I knew so much about mm. their funny little show. But I, yeah, I, as now that I'm doing shit, I f- as soon as it's done, I forget what, what I did. You do if it's your own stuff. And you don't care about your own stuff much, do you? No, no. Like, I'm always, like, with this podcast... Afterwards. I had someone message me this morning and be like, oh, when you said... The, a couple of podcasts ago when you said the line about coming in coke I cried and I was like that sounds like me but I don't remember that at all <laughs> it does sound like you Lewis <laughs> um, I'm just checking the time here uh, oh yeah do I need to start working on the radio show you might need to you might need to what, what time is it uh, it is it mm. is uh, oh yeah maybe oh, I better start working on it soon all right, I'll yeah. um, I'll finish up with uh, <laughs> with a question. What I generally do is just a question from a listener that has nothing to do with either of us, just from their life. Oh, nice, some life advice stuff. Um, yeah. So this email was is from uh, a girl called L, and the subject line is "My dad saw my burlesque show." <laughs> So, Ripper. <laughs> hey, hi, L. <laughs> I think you're lucky that anybody saw a burlesque show. Mm. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I, I don't like burlesque much, much. So sorry, L. I've sorry. Uh, I've performed in a burlesque venue with. Uh, it's in Melbourne. I can't remember the name of it, but they have burlesque shows on, and it's like a vaudeville show. They have strong men and juggling, all this kind oh, yeah. of old timey stuff, and uh, they have stand ups as well every now and then, which is very hard to follow a guy who was just juggling fire and then be like, I only really say words. Oh, yeah, no, that'd be awful, difficult, be a terrible gig. But the funniest you- thing about that is uh, because of burlesque venue as well they have a backstage area so I, the first time I went there I was like hey where's the um, the backstage area and he goes oh just through here and I walk in and it's just naked women everywhere and I'm like oh no I've walked naked in naked women well yeah because they're changing into their costumes oh you did a sort of Donald Trump that Lewis this is terrible I know but they told do? me to sit there and I go oh no I'm sorry they told you to sit there the, what? but then the burlesque acts are like oh no are you on stage tonight I'm like yeah yeah he goes okay well you can stay here and I'm like no I feel really? weird just just watching being around you while you change yeah and that's odd because there's like some guy oh, getting his knives ready and then there's some girl getting her boobs ready and I'm like I don't really need anything it's all in my head I'm gonna yeah, sit no. with the audience no yeah at a stand up club you don't normally no. have boobs or knives no out, you don't do you no <laughs> just beers mm. um, <laughs> anyway we should, let's try and help Els we've got to help El, even yeah. though even though I'm not a burlesque fan I'm sorry right. um what do you need, Elle? Uh, hi, Lewis. Call me Elle. Uh, I'm in my second year of university and I do burlesque in the city Friday and Saturday nights. I think this might be the place that I'm talking about too. Oh, okay. Um, to help cover living costs. However, my parents don't know because I come from a very reserved family and they and knew they would flip out if they ever found out about me doing burlesque. 
Last week was my oh. birthday, and my parents came down to surprise me the weekend before, and then my dad went to the club that I dance at. Um, what, by coincidence? I guess so, because if they don't know, it sounds like they just came to see her, and then during the night, the, his dad went alone to a burlesque club. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so that's what it sounds Ill. like happened. Get a new dad first. Yeah. <laughs> What's he doing going and I think seeing the, burlesque on his that's own? That's the real problem, is not that he's seeing you. But anyway, Why so... Why is he seeing burlesque what, on his own? Going to the right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if you're going to... Yeah, that's right. If you're going to do something like that, you may as well just go the whole hog and, you know, go go and see a prostitute. <laughs> I mean, why... why go? Maybe... Oh, look, up. that's very strange. Um... um but and maybe she, he likes burlesque. Maybe. Look, maybe Elle, Elle a, should have known that her dad goes to burlesque shows you before would think becoming so. a burlesque dancer. Well, shouldn't, maybe shouldn't, it just runs in the she? family, a passion for burlesque. Well, there, there's always a risk, isn't there, that your parents are going to see you doing something publicly that you shouldn't be doing if you, if you do that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she goes, now, I wear a, a wig and fairly heavy makeup compared to everyday attire, so I'm not sure if he recognised me or not. <laughs> But he's been acting weird. Do I confront him? But he's been acting weird. Well, either because he's sneaking off to burlesque show. Well, that's weird. Part of acting weird. Do I confront him? If so, how? Thanks, have a shit one. Hmm. Uh, that's hard. Do I confront him? If so, how? If he's been acting weird, he knows. He knows if he's For been sure. acting weird. Yes, if he's been acting weird. But he hasn't mentioned. I well, saw that's you the in thing. The... He shouldn't be at burlesque either. Oh, of course. Because it sounds yeah. like he went without his wife. That's really odd. Because burlesque isn't that bad. Like, your wife's not going to leave you, is she, if you go and see burlesque show? A burlesque shows aren't that I, naughty. No, they're, burlesque they're shows are not that naughty, naughty but going bit. to burlesque by yourself without your wife yeah. and not telling her, that's sus. That's pretty off, isn't it? I mean, that's it's almost like going out to a nice restaurant by yourself without your wife and just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's Except kind of the weird. It's just has, weird. Has attractive women yeah. showing you. Oh, you going to Hooters. almost showing you their nipples? Yeah, if you went to Hooters. Or yeah. Know. Does Melbourne have a Hooters? No, it doesn't. But I'm mm, good. I have heard of it. Good. It's a very, it's a very dire place. Mm. Um, look, I, I don't know what sort of relationship you have, El, with your dad. It's obviously not a hundred percent open. Um, very reserved, and I know they'd flip out <laughs> if they found out. Well, See, that's, that's why he's acting weird. Because it sounds like he, he, she's, his wife would flip out if she knew he was there. Oh, yeah. But he wants to problem. flip out because he knows he's doing okay. his dancing well, there. Yeah, no, there's, there's secrets and liars here, aren't there? It's like a Mike mm. Lee movie. I, I think, I think El, you need to go and just see your dad solo and say, yeah, maybe you can broach it gently. Like, yeah. <laughs> No, no, not in costume. And don't invite him backstage no. to the area where all the boobs are out. Mm. Don't do that. Um <laughs> and I think maybe you could just drop a hint like dad I've I've got a new job and I just wanted to ask you what you think about it and then ask him to guess D can you guess what, what I'm doing and maybe you can wheedle it mm. out of him you know out of the earshot of your mum yeah so that at that's least, a good idea at least she doesn't have to you know, just in case he doesn't know in case he doesn't know in him. case he doesn't know and then his secret is kind of safe too you know but geez you'd feel shit if he was like ah oh, scientist or doctor <laughs> Because <laughs> then, cause then right. you have to. Well, then the problem is if he doesn't know, what do you say your new job is? Oh, well, you got to come up with that. That's where you need a conversation yeah. map. So if he says, "I know you're a burlesque dancer," and then, then you've you've come clean because you you've got something over him. You know that he goes to see burlesque. Well, yeah, because that, that's probably a good thing. If he knows you're a dancer, he can't get angry at you because. Then you've got well. Why the fuck are you seeing yeah, burlesque, well, yeah. you dirty old man? That's right. You're a burlesque fan. Why do you mm. disapprove so much? Um, exactly. You know, you should you should think it's great that I'm <laughs> providing the entertainment that you that you. Like. He might, are they conservative? Like maybe poli political said. conservatives. Yeah. They they don't like to enjoy themselves sexually. Mm. So but the, but but they do. So burlesque is a good compromise for mm. them, isn't it? So maybe maybe that's what it's all about. Yeah. I think, uh, you, yeah, that's a good that's a good way. Can you guess what my new job is? Yeah, and you need a backup to tell him what what the new job is. But it can't be such an impression. Well, because then he might actually, if, if if you then lie and say I am a doctor, he'll he'll want to mm. come and visit your surgery. Needs to be something that he can't ever visit. Just say call center. 
No one wants to visit a call center. No one to call, yeah. And no one wants to ask no you questions about it. Yeah, or you can say you work, you know, like for some government department. No yes. one would ever want to go in there. Yes. Just say, I'm, I'm with quarantine. I'm with, I'm, I've got a job with the Department of Quarantine. It sounds so boring. Yes, yes um, it does. <laughs> you know, no, he wouldn't know where to go. Yeah. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be interested. Um, yeah, I think that might solve it for you, Elle. Yeah, well... Um, I think uh, I think we've solved Elle's problem. Give me an update, Elle, and uh, let us know. And I'll I'll fill Andrew um, in if you send me an email back. If you've been disowned or if your dad thinks you're working <laughs> the government of quarantine, let us know. <laughs> and just uh, please don't give us free tickets to your burlesque show. Though. No, I thank you. I don't want that. I'm good. <laughs> uh, well, thanks very much for joining me, Andrew. I Pleasure. appreciate thank it. you, Lewis. Uh, are you working on <laughs> anything that you'd like to tell people about? I've got to plug my book. Mm-hmm. Um, I've written a, a book with my wife, Jess Roberts. I've got to plug this because I want people to buy it for any eight-year-olds that you know. We've written a junior fiction book. That's cool. Um, and we, we worked our asses off on this. It's been in the works for like eight years. Um, it's called... Nine years. It's called Bab Sharky and the Animal Mummies. And it's uh, it's a cool story. We think we think it's a funny adventure story about a lonely boy who's stuck in the Egyptian desert, and he finds a magic pharaoh's beard, which leads him to this lost city full of mummified animals that are brought magically to life. Fuck! I've got to get this. It's awesome. It's actually seriously an awesome story. I, I'm 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 very excited about it. Um, although it's our first book, and and mm. we, there's a sequel that we're working on now, and I think we've <laughs> we've learned how to write a book. For the second book. Well, that's um, good. Maybe you guys will be the new Captain cool. Underpants. Look, yeah, well, does that get better as it goes? Ah, uh, yeah. And it was and it was a huge for kids. You I know, think I was reading that when yeah. I was eight. Captain Underpants is great. Well, I want to. Yeah. So if you know kids, grab Bab Sharky and the Animal Mummies. It's out early, mate. Yeah, brilliant. That's, that's my plug. Thanks, Lewis. No, no worries. Thanks for having me on. And uh, keep up what you're doing. Appreciate it. Cheers.